thank you so much for agreeing to be one of our lady leaders that we get to know a little bit more. Um, I know that while we have spoken, this is also going to be discovery, a lot of discovery for me. Um, <laughs> learning a little bit about you. So thank you again for taking time out of your schedule to be here. So why don't we start off today by just getting to know you a little bit. Um, why don't you tell us who is Donna Wellington, a little bit about your journey, where you came from, and where you are today. Okay. Um, well, um, who is, uh, is very, I'm very happy to be here. I'll, I'll say that up front. And, um, you know, this is something that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about, um, helping others and, um, you know, sharing my journey is something that I, I do quite a bit. Um, because it wasn't a usual, I don't, I don't think it was very usual, but it, it is just testament to the fact that anything can happen. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Right. So um, I started working at, well, I, I go a little further back than that. Um, I was born in England uh, and I came, my parents uh, split, divorced when I was, you know, very young. So I, I moved from England when I was two and a half and um, I came to Barbados. Uh, so my mother was a single mother and um, it was two of us, me and my sister. And she was eight months and I was two and a half when we came to Barbados. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if, I fa uh, if I fast track that story another couple of years, um, my mother actually, uh, when I was around 11, found out she had colon cancer. And she actually passed when I was 13 and my sister was 11. So we had two years uh, in between there. So I went from um, having one parent to having no parents and, and then was, was basically raised by aunts and grannies and, and stuff like that um, all the way up. So from early on, I guess from 13 or so, you know, I, I put in my head, you know, I had to, you know, make a way for myself and, and, and try and, and push to, to do what. So I gave... I, I always, you know, had that in the back of my mind. I have to make sure that I can support myself and, and do those sorts of things. So around 16, um, when you start to be able to get summer jobs and that sort of stuff, I worked at CXE for a while. And um, I think I got my first job at 18 after I finished school here um, at 18. And um, that was working, I think, as a, as a person in American Airlines that, um, helps with the bags and stuff like that. That was my first job. I think I did that for maybe a month before I got a job at uh, what was then Barbados Mutual Life Assurance Society and now it's Sagicor. Uh, in Sagicor, I actually worked for, I worked there for 10 years from 1989 to, to, 2000, to 1989 to 1999. And during that time, I think I probably did about five different jobs. Every other year mm -hmm. I got... I, I got moved. Um, I think what was interesting about that period of my life, I learned quite a bit uh, in financial services. And, and in, in between there, I was doing um, my degree in accounting at UE, which I happened to do while I was working. So from I started at 19 um, and I worked in the day and studied at night and went to school um, in the afternoons and the evenings after school um, and spent and, and I had a, a really good in my second, uh, my third and fourth year, because I did it in four years, in my third and fourth year, uh, even though I had to go to school during the day, uh, the job I was doing at the time, I could actually work kind of different hours. And my bosses allowed me to um, work, go to school and work back in the time later on in the afternoon. So that worked very well for me. And um, I spent basically all Saturdays um, in the boardroom in, at, at, at Sajikor, basically doing um, the homework from school and all that sort of stuff. I, I used to spend a whole bunch of time <laughs> in the office back then. Um, but anyway, nothing has much changed. But anyway, uh, when, I, when I finished, when I got, after my first job at, at Sajikor, which was just keying journals um, back in the day when you used to do that sort of thing mm -hmm. um, in the accounts department. I recognized that the person that I had taken over from, it was very, very nervous. Um, I don't think you would recognize the person I used to be if, if, you, if you met that person that I was at 18. 
I was very nervous, very, very introverted, um, never said anything to anyone, but um, I still had visions and dreams for myself. And um, when I finished the, when I, when I started the first job at Sandra Corkeen Journals, I recognized that the person that had done it before me had actually moved and changed jobs. First job I had, but it was, it was, that person had changed jobs within a year. I said, well, if she can do that, why can't I? And so, you know, that started me thinking about what could I do to move to the next job, move to the next job. And it just started, that started me thinking that way and not thinking that, you know, somebody gave you this job to do and you must do that until, you know, that happens. But I, I think what is the most interesting thing about um, my time at Sajikor was that first job that I went into was the only job I really ever applied for in my life up to this point. Um, every job after that, um, somebody came from another department and said, we've heard about you. We would like you to come and work for us. And um, so I said, I, I worked in Sajikor for 10 years and I had five jobs and the other four, um, another person from another division or another manager just said, come and work for me. Um, I would like you to work for me over here. Um, and I worked from everything from um, in the accounts department, reinsurance, systems analyst, programmer in IT. Um, and I, I eventually found my home maybe about four or five years into it in the investments department um, working. Um, I was a stock broker at one point. Um, I did different things and that was after I finished my, my, um, my accounting degree. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, uh, I then went to work for Ernst & Young and, and that was the first job I ever applied for. Um, well, after that, I applied for a job at an offshore company and Ernst Young was the hiring officer and they did the interview. I got the job, but the person said they didn't want to give me the job because they thought I would bore too quickly and would leave them. And mm -hmm. so they said they didn't want me to come and work for them after all. But the person at Ernst Young who was doing the hiring said, um, you know, we got to get her over here to Ernst Young. And so they came after me to be a consultant or a senior consultant um, at Ernst & Young in their, in, the, um, in their advisory team. I'd never done anything like that before. I was, <laughs> I was doing accounting. Um, mm -hmm. So I was like, consulting, what is that? What do you do? Uh, but anyway, I, I went over there and they wanted a senior consultant. I didn't get the senior consultant role, but they took me as a consultant rather than a senior consultant. In, in a year and a half, I was the senior consultant, but you know, I moved from there and then from there, I got a call from Ernst & Young from, from PwC um, to come and do the same thing, but in a managerial post at PwC. So I spent five years in consulting um, between Ernst & Young and PwC. During that time, I was doing my accountant designation as well. Um, so I'm a C, it used to be a CGA, no CPA. Um, so I did accounting, accounting, accounting all the way through. Um, how did I get to First Caribbean? Again, it was the weirdest story. Um, it just, it, I just have to say that when, when the lawyer has a plan for you, he has a plan for you. But when I, when I went to, when I was at Ernst, when I was at PwC, I was in St. Vincent um, on a consulting job, um, um, doing some due diligence in an insurance company in St. Vincent. I went to lunch um, in a little restaurant. I was upstairs. It was a dark, up there was dark. And um, I felt like I was in a booth in the back, in the corner in the dark. And these four people came in from First Caribbean. One of them I knew from Barbados. Um, and he was responsible for, he was uh, in the investment, uh, in corporate investment banking at, at First Caribbean. And he, I knew him from before because I had presented um, at PwC uh, a project to them um, for financing. And um, he walked straight up to me and said, I've been looking for you everywhere. Uh, I remember I'm in St. Vincent, right. <laughs> in a restaurant in St. Vincent. And he says, I've been looking for you everywhere. And I said, what for? Do you have a client for me or whatever? He says, no, no, I want to offer you a job. I was like, oh, really? wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, doing what? So then we started talking and I came over from, I, I went from being a manager at PwC to coming over here as, a, as, a, as an analyst at First Caribbean, but it was still paying more and I didn't care. Um, but when I came into banking, I probably was in banking as an analyst in, in, a, in a new department they set up for corporate finance, um, which was the larger loans in the bank regionally. 
within corporate investment banking. And it probably was two or three weeks before I said to myself, what was I doing for the whole rest of my life? I mean, like, mm-hmm. this is where I'm supposed to be. This, it was the first job. I had probably done, by that time, what, seven or eight jobs. And I tell people that as I, as I talk to them, that, you know, your first job or your second job, you think that your career has to be what you start off doing. You have no idea what it is that you're actually supposed to be doing until some time passes and all of your experiences lead up to what it is that you were really meant to do eventually. But you have to go through that process and, and um, kiss a few frogs with respect to your career before you actually get to the thing that you're really truly meant to do. Very few people do it right away and right. start off doing what they're doing. But, um, you know, very quickly within First Caribbean, um, I went, well, I went, I went, I, I've been here for 15 years now. And I went from um, being an analyst uh, over maybe about two years or so. Um, I, I went from an analyst to a manager of, of a specialized area for real estate um, financing, real estate and hospitality financing, then to an associate director. Um, and then uh, that was about, that was about six years in. Uh, my boss asked me to go to Bahamas for two years to just help um, at a senior level as an associate director to help the team there to be stronger, the corporate team to be stronger, just do my job, but from over there right. and just help them to, to you know, to, to you know, strengthen on, on the corporate side. And um, when I was over there, the bottom was basically falling out of, of the financial, of the real estate, hospitality it was two, between 2009 and 2011, things were really bad. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and when you would know from, from um, your days uh, in the bank, how bad things were back then. Right. And the bank basically turned off the tap on lending and said, you know, we actually need you to help us with our bad debt. So I turned around then and started a little department, took two analysts from my team and, um, started a department called corporate credit recoveries. And all I did then was basically try not within the special loans unit, but in a special unit within corporate to try and see how we could fix a whole bunch of the hotels that were going sideways and the real estate developments and all that stuff. Um, and it was because of that opportunity and, and, and having to speak to, I guess the, inter- the, the folks from Canada and stuff that were responsible for, 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 overseeing you know the massive special loans issues that we had at the time that I guess I I really got a whole bunch of gumption and 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 actually spoke fairly straight to to some folks that probably didn't think you know who is this person and where does she come from Um, but I I would have defended um, the position that I had I don't know what I did or or what it was that 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 did it for them but all i can tell you is um i was an associate director at the time and um the layers in first caribbean associate director director no i when i started at first caribbean i remember saying in 2005 i went to some training somewhere and somebody said to me you know what should we know about you and i had looked at the i had looked at first caribbean and i looked at the executive in first caribbean back then and back then there was only one person that was female mm-hmm. in the executive at First Caribbean. And I just remember saying in that forum, having been at the bank maybe two months or three months, um, a very different person from the, the, the shy person that would not have said anything to anyone back when I was 18. But I remember saying that there's not enough estrogen um, in the executive <laughs> and that needs to change. I remember saying that 2005 and some of my friends actually remember that. No, uh, as time passed, I said to myself, well, hold on. Um, I watched a whole bunch of people get fired. You know, it was like, who are the weak, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. So the executive used to change all the time and everything. And I said, well, I don't want to get up there anytime soon. Um, what I will do, cause I started, I, I, when it was, when I got here, I was 34. Um, at the time, I've been working 31 years now. 
Um, but when I, when I was, when I first got here at 34, I said, well, okay, how I see this going in my head is that you wait until you're in your fifties, late fifties, um, because you're likely to have about three years as an executive best tops. So you want to finish your career on a high note. So late fifties, going into your sixties, you, you get to the executive, you do something up there at that level. And then, you know, when you are fired, then, you know, you're okay because you're at the kind of end of your career anyway. So that was my plan. I wanted to get to associate director, director and kind of hang up there until I got to that kind of age, which I'm still not at at this mm -hmm. point because I'm 49 now. Well, close, um, not close, right. Yeah, not, not as close as I thought I needed to be in order to, to be there. So anyway, um, having gone through this corporate credit recoveries unit that I started and all this, um, a number of, of, of places shifted, but I was associate director, then there's director, then there's executive director, and then there's executive. Um, and so I thought, you know, I'm way down the total pole, gonna hang out here at associate director for a couple more years, and then, then hopefully a director spot will come up, and, and then, you know, I'll hang out there for another, I don't know, seven or eight years or whatever, and then at some point, you know, I'll get up there all of a whole bunch of people left and and what was interesting is my my boss um at the time kept saying to me okay when you get he 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 was a very interesting guy but he said when when you get when you're an executive do this i'm like what are you talking about you're, you're making no sense that's years from now and i said you hear what i said when you get to executive x and y and z and i just dismissed that out of hand and then he left and all of a sudden, everybody started to shift and shift and shift. And all of a sudden, I got, I happened to be in Barbados when he left. Now, I was a little concerned on a number of fronts. The first one being that um, he had sent me to Bahamas. My job wasn't in Barbados anymore. You're now leaving the organization. I'm in a, a department that I wasn't quite sure what it was. And here I am stuck out here. What is going to happen to me? He said, well, you should go and talk to the CEO about that. I said, talk to the CEO? Are you insane? Like, what do you, what do you mean talk to the CEO? I've never spoken to him. Uh, he says, you hear what I said? Go and talk to the CEO. So I said, okay. So I wrote the CEO a note. Hello. Um, my boss said I should speak to you. Um, I'm actually here in Barbados. And, you know, he says, okay, come see me, you know, tomorrow at 10. I, I walk in there and he says, Oh, um, have you ever thought about um, managing like a country or anything? I was like, no. <laughs> what do you mean? He says like, so if you were the managing director of Barbados, you know, like how would you go about that? And I told him what I thought. And he said, okay, thank you very much. 15 minutes conversation. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I may have some other people that need to talk to you. Um, so make sure, let, me get, let me get your cell phone number because we may talk to you when you're back in Bahamas. And I get, to the, I get to the elevator and he runs after me and says, come back, come back. The, the folks will speak to you now. Oh, so wow. I'm sitting outside of his room. <laughs> and the next thing I know, four other people, four other execs walk into the room. And then they come in and, and they sit me down and said, this is your interview for managing director uh, of Barbados. <laughs> and, oh, wow. and, and the next day they called me and told me the job is yours. I that is not normal, right? Not in any way, shape or form, it's not normal. Um, but that, is, that, is, that was seven years ago. Uh, and so I became an executive at 41 when I thought that it should have happened around 56. Um, and it has been the ride of a lifetime. It has been um, the challenge I never thought um, I wanted, but I'm so glad I got. Um, I've gone through all sorts of things now and now, you know, four years ago, becoming on, not just a managing director in Barbados, but also the president of the Bankers Association, um, leading, leading the banks through and the, and the creditors committee through debt restructuring, change of government, all kinds of craziness that has happened in the last little while. Um, it has been a ride of a lifetime, but one I wouldn't change for the world now, but it's, that's the journey. <laughs>
That is quite an exhilarating journey as well. I mean, I didn't take it with you. I'm sitting here for all of two minutes and I feel like I'm exhausted, right? <laughs> Obviously, the pace of change for you has been significant. Yeah. And so there are a number of things floating around in my head, Donna. Mm -hmm. um, your story really speaks to resilience and self-motivation and transformational uh, uh, leadership and being a visionary. Um, but at the very beginning, you said something that really spoke to me, and that is that you you basically lost your mom and dad, which would be mm -hmm. our foundation, our pillars as we grow up. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that in itself, that loss that you faced early on in life, in any way, shape or form prepared you for the transitions that you have gone through? And if so, you know, what, what has that been for you? Um, I'd say yes, because um, not only did I, I lose them um, pretty early up, um, I did have other family member members who, who were there for me. And I'm thankful for that because I don't know where I would have been, you know, had I not had a great grandmother and, and other aunts and so on. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with you that there's, I didn't, usually um, a person lives one place. <laughs> um, so, um, Children aren't accustomed to, you know, packing bags and, and just living out of a suitcase or a bag and just moving from one place to the other. Um, because of, of um, how my life was, I was one place in the, in the, in the um, week and another place on the weekends and shifting from this place and that place and, and whatever. And, you know, the ability of you to adapt to a, a whole number of, of those circumstances, moving from one household to another and going to live with an aunt and, go, you know, living with a grandmother. And then all of those things really, you know, help you not to be stuck um, mm -hmm. and have to, you know, and, and figure that your surroundings have to be a certain way um, in order for your life to be stable. Um, the other thing that I will tell you up front that, that, that really stabilized me is my faith. Um, I am a born again believer and I don't know what I would have done um, if I did not have my faith as, as a thing that was the one constant in my life. Um, there's been a whole bunch of change. Um, I change jobs fairly often. A lot of people don't do that. Uh, and because of this feeling of, of stability that people want, people don't yeah. tend to shake yeah. and move like that. Um, but those things don't happen. I, I realize even in my, in my living and in my home now, um, I, try, I, I am not a, a huge keeper of stuff. Right. I, I purge and clear out and keep things light um, because you're always ready to move or do whatever has to be done. Right. And I, I, I find all of those things have, have kind of shaped me, you know, I guess my, like you said, just, it wasn't, it wasn't so much my parents, but, but having to change and adapt and move and, and be nimble and, and, right. and that sort of thing. Right. That has helped. Fantastic. I mean, your story is one of inspiration, frankly. Um, so for other young ladies who have come into, into the industry with a similar mindset that you do have to kind of calcify in one role before considering moving into another one. Mm -hmm. How would you say that your own mindset sort of prepared you for that sort of quick movement and quick pace in your mm -hmm. career? Well, I, I, I will say to you, uh, uh, it's, it's a combination of everything that's gone before, but what I, I find from even talking to, 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 to ladies within our organization here within the bank and and i do a lot of mentoring um, at church and everything too people get stuck people get very comfortable mm -hmm. they like routines they like to know what is going to happen they like to know that this is my job and i learn how to do it i learn how to do it well and i you know i i'm afraid of making yeah. any changes because I might not know what that is. I can't tell you how many time I've, times I've spoken to persons that have been tellers or something like that for years. And I'm like, why are you still a teller? There's mm -hmm. more that you can do. Well, you know, I think I don't have the experience with the next thing I said, but when you became a teller, did you have the experience with that? Did, right. right. You know, like, so what is, there's a fair, I find, um, 
not just of women, men too, but, but women love to know where they're at and, and, and want that sense of stability. It's, it's ingrained in us right. um, somewhat. And you have to kind of pull yourself out of that and say, you know, I am good enough to do the next thing. You know, there's, it's a self, it's a self confidence thing as well as a, as a, as a, a comfort yeah. um, that we have to pull ourselves out of to say, I am good enough. I can manage to change. It will not overwhelm me. Um, and I'll roll with it. And, and, right. and um, you know, leading both men and women, you know, I, I see that as well. And I, I try to make sure that I, I draw and I pull from people what I think is the, is what they're capable of, you know, because looking for that and trying to pull that out of people is what I enjoy the most right. about, about, about my life now being able to feed into people that way, seeing people that are at the very beginning of their careers and seeing people that are, are not at the beginning, but, you know, may have been working for 30 years and you can see that they can do more but they're just, no, 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 I, I like it here. Yeah, you know, yeah, I like to push push them out of the nest. Yeah. Like give yeah. them more to do. And perhaps you're right, the, the, the life start that you were dealt has helped you break, mm -hmm. break those chains of mm -hmm. a, a need for stability, which most of us females are socialized to look for. Even in our mm -hmm. marriages, we look for someone mm -hmm. who provides a sense of stability and so on. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that experience with us. Uh, tell me, Donna, do you think that your experience in the industry has been any different from your male counterparts? And if so, are there any real life experiences that come to mind with this question? Um, I'd say yes. Uh, there are things about being a woman um, that make you different in this in this um, in this field. Um, it it is very male dominated, especially at the top. Um, and that was evidenced by what I saw when I first came into the industry. Um, I don't think before me, even in Barbados, there had been any managing directors or CEOs of, 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 um, banks in Barbados ever, mm -hmm. um, you know, here and, su and such like that. So it, it. It is a it is an interesting world um, when when it's when it is male dominated because how men think and how women think are different. Mm -hmm. um, they complement each other, but if it's all been male dominated, getting that nexus between the two is sometimes a, a journey. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that women have to work harder um, at it to be accepted. Um, if I were male, when I got this job, I don't think that people would have looked at me, you know, like, who is this person coming in here? You know, what's her claim to fame and that sort of stuff? They, they, I think it would have been more. And you, you feel like you have to, um, you feel that like you really have to prove your, your metal. Right. Um, very much in, in, in this world. The good thing I will say about First Caribbean, and I, and I felt it more when I was in the professional service firms, um, not so much at, at, at in, in, in the insurance industry, but in the professional service firms, I, I did feel um, that that males had a, had a, a leg up above. But I have to say, in, in this organization, it was the first place I ever really worked that I felt that, you know, I was equal. Um, and my contributions were as equal as anybody else's and that um, they would have been recognized for what they are. Um, and I haven't seen anything to date that would suggest otherwise. And it has been 15 years. Uh, and now I'm actually in a space where I can make sure that that equal continues. But and we now do have a female CEO. She's the first female that we've ever had as a CEO um, in the in in um, in the bank here, um, which is over the region, not not right, just right. Barbados and East. Uh, I'm Barbados and Eastern Caribbean, but she's the whole region. Um, and so there are not a lot of us in the executive. There are only four, three of us in the executive. Um, and we want to see that three out of three out of fifteen. 
Wow. So, you know, there's still a ways to go and there's mm-hmm. still more estrogen required. Mm-hmm. Um, but we can see coming up in the organization, we see the flip because what we see now is that women represent 70% of our entire workforce and men right. only 30. So as, as those persons come up in the organization, um, whilst it is still male dominated right now, the next generation yes. is likely to be the flip. Um, simply because we're starting to see this trend where we don't see a lot of men um, in Amazing. these roles anymore. Right. So I think the, we're actually at the, at the transition pivot point. Um, but in the beginning, it, it really did feel as if you had to work harder to, to, to justify and prove. Mm-hmm. Um, your seat at the table. Your seat at the table. Mm-hmm. And, and my, my boss did tell me something. Because when I did get the executive, uh, um, there were some things that she had to kind of shake out of me. Uh, and she just was doing that in observing. She was a CEO at the time, but she was my boss. Um, and she said to me, you know, when you're at the exec table, you know, I find you do this. It's like, you know, when you, when you are trying to speak, you feel like you have to, you know, like, hello, yeah. I'm yes, here. Yes, yeah. She's like, no, stop that. You know, just, just put yourself out there and, and you know, I even had to learn those sorts of things, you know, in the last seven years doing this job. Because you start off, especially when you're, you're coming from a, a junior position, right. launched into an executive position, everybody's looking at you. The people around the table, <laughs> as well as the rest of the organization, is like, what just happened? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Why are you there? And, mm-hmm. and, you know, you feel that you have to prove yourself to everyone. So I had mm-hmm. to get over that. Um, that took a while. That probably took an, uh, about two years or the seven. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, you know, no, I don't feel like I have to do that any, anymore. Yeah. Well, certainly as president <laughs> of the Bankers Association, you can't, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but it sounds like, it sounds like you had a great mentor in her, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, because we do also have an opportunity, like you have said, to recognize the shifts that are happening within the industry and position ourselves to assist those who are coming up. So mm-hmm. I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit here and say, um, that we will be launching our first mentorship program in the cab. Mm-hmm. And we're certainly hopeful that our first ladies um, through the series will all say yes when we come sure. knocking on the door. I know that your plate is full, clearly. No, but, but uh, happy to do that. I'm, I always have time for, for that sort of thing because excellent. Um, it's, that's, that's how people learn. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I had two great mentors. One, one um, Pat Downs Grant at Sajikor, who, who went on to be you know, the head of Sajikor Life. Uh, second only to, to Doddridge um, in Sajikor. Um, mm-hmm. She was my first mentor. Actually, I, I credit her with, with actually showing me that a woman could get to the top um, and that it Fantastic. was possible. And, and it was because of, she was my boss and my mentor. Uh, and because of her, she made me think it was possible mm-hmm. uh, and, and gave me basically the gumption to, 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 to step forward. It was always in there, but I just hadn't had I hadn't seen anyone. There are very few um, women, um, at least back then. You know, right. no women are everywhere in Barbados as prime minister and everything. But back then, um, you know, they, it wasn't there. So, you know, I needed to see that actually demonstrated someplace. Fantastic. As a female leader yourself, what are you most proud about? What is one of your greatest accomplishments? And conversely, what would have been one of your greater opportunities okay. uh, during your career path? Um, one of my greatest accomplishments uh, has to be um, no, the, the two really. One is people focus and, and actually tr- seeing the growth in my direct reports um, and, and the team below them um, gives me immense joy. Just, just seeing that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a transformational leader and, 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 and seeing transformation actually happen. Um, not just in the business, but also in the people who I manage uh, and seeing them come up and reach their full potential. Nothing makes me happier. Um, and, I, and I want to see them, you know, grow and grow and, and, and come into my role and, you know, pass me out and, and, and do those sorts of things. I, I want to see that. And, and I'm working on my team to make sure, make sure of that. But the other thing I have to say, which is, is both within the bank as well as outside, the thing I'm most proud of now is um, in this role, 
the ability to influence change both on a macro level, um, both in the Eastern Caribbean and in Barbados, as well as um, in the banking sector and changing or um, trying to change or how we are or how we are viewed in the public space and by our um, our, our clients, you know, the governments, usually there's a lot of tension between the banks and the governments trying to make sure that we bridge those gaps and also, um, you know, transforming how people interact with banks is, is something that gives me great joy. You know, we, we're on this roadmap and the path to, towards, um, you know, very first world payment systems and that sort of stuff. Anything that, that allows us to move and change and, and, and go in that direction. Um, I'm trying to lead the charge. I'm trying to make sure that by the time as I finish those role, the role that I'm in now, um, if they ever let me out, um, it will be a situation where what I came and found is not what was left. And, and that's, that's, that's my goal you know, both outside and inside of the bank, that, that whatever I do, you know, I, I want very much to be inspirational and transformational in terms of, of how I deal with both um, the people that I manage, but also, you know, what I've done you right. know, within the, the team. The legacy. The legacy yeah. Great. If you were to share one very critical bit of advice with young ladies coming into this industry, mm -hmm. what would that advice be? Know your stuff. And once you know your stuff, be confident in what you know. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't doubt, don't doubt who you are um, or, 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 or feel somehow that you're less than anybody else. Um, self-confidence I think is so critical and your ability to have self-confidence helps you navigate what to me half of the job is knowing and the other half is navigating the the um, the politics around um, people and leader and other leaders or other persons and you know people that you have to the stakeholders um, and if you're not careful, you know, you will let people's comments about you um, chart your destiny. Right. And it's so important to, to know who you are for yourself. So that even if somebody says something about you, um, be teachable and make sure that what they're saying isn't true. But once you know it isn't true, you know. Yeah, keep trucking. Keep trucking. Mm -hmm. And you know, I listen to you speak, and there's obviously you said the Saturday mornings in the boardroom, which hasn't changed. Uh, getting no, no, no. Saturdays have changed. The, the Saturdays, I, I spend a lot of time in here. Okay. But but weekends, I, I see it's very sacred. No, you ask me what I do on Saturday mornings. Fantastic. But I, it's not about Saturday mornings for me. It's about Saturday evenings because the sun uh -huh. is kind of hot on Saturday mornings. <laughs> what I do on Saturday evenings, I think, is more interesting. Um, on Saturday evenings. I am usually found out in my garden and not just in my garden. There's a, there's about an acre of land behind my house and I'm usually out there with either a lawnmower or a weed whacker in full boots and everything um, for two or three hours on a Saturday afternoon. That, oh. That's where you'll find me on Saturday afternoons. Okay. Um, cutting grass, weed whacking, doing something outside. I can't think of anything that's more therapeutic. You right. see what you've done. You know, when you've mowed down an acre of, of, of grass and you look back at it, you know, it's a thing of beauty. It does grow back the next day or the next week, but you can do it all over again. Um, but I, nothing gives me more joy. Listen, here's a challenge for you. Somehow I'm looking at those hands that are flashing before me and they don't look like they can do that kind of Gloves, work. gloves, gloves are great. <laughs> yeah, sunscreen. Hats with hats with a, a flap down the back so that you, you know, and I do it in the I do it around four, three thirty, right. four to six because that sun is too hot in the morning. Right, so right. Okay. on Saturday mornings, I'll have a cup of coffee and I'll be watching Food Network. 
or something like that and and be inside but on the afternoons i'll, I'll be out in the in the bush <laughs> all right and, and do you try those recipes you find on food network oh i i i love cooking i absolutely love cooking um one of the things i do um at least one this is the first year in probably about 15 years that hasn't happened and just because of covid um but our church has a a, a summer camp a sleep-in summer camp and i'm the cook uh, literally chief cook and bottle washer so I, I buy all this stuff organize the kitchen um and cook for 100 people for a week okay um but i, I love cooking love it love it love it um if, if if it used to pay me to the manner to which i've become accustomed um you know i see it as a career i just love i love doing that i just i love cooking if i could do gardening and cooking to, and be paid to the manner to which i've become accustomed I probably do that as another alter. I do that as an alternative job. Fantastic. Before you said that you cook for a hundred people, I was going to say the next time I'm in Barbados, we're not eating out, but you know what? I'll take that back. Cause clearly you're yeah. going to blow me away. Right. <laughs> so you brought up the question, which is going to follow um, in terms of COVID and what did you learn about yourself during that period of COVID? Uh, maybe not as a leader, but as an individual, what did COVID teach you? Um, COVID taught me, you have no idea what capacity you have <laughs> until it is put to the test. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very difficult time. I mean, when you're accustomed working in your office and you have a whole bunch of things to do, but you know what to do, all of a sudden you're, you're home. Uh, in my case, I was sitting, sitting at my kitchen table, didn't feel like going in the office. So I was, I want to be able to look outside a whole lot more um, and, and, and at least, you know, that's the, that's the only time you saw people if people pass the road. Um, so I, I did it from my kitchen table. Um, but the pace at which, you know, I, I'm in charge of seven countries here, um, this job that I'm in now. Um, and it was managing drama in seven countries, protocols in seven countries. And in the case of Barbados, you're in charge because you're the, the, the Bankers Association president, you know, the attorney general calling you to find out, you know, what was it the banks want to do and, you know, how are we going to work this out and everything. And, and you know, the private sector trying to figure out like, how, may, how are we going to get paid? And, uh, you know, like, and this is happening in seven different places and you're trying to figure out how it works. And then all of your staff are all nervous and stuff like that. So it learned, I learned during that time, um, when you're stretched, you don't know that you have more in you until you're stretched and then you realize you actually have more capacity than you thought you did. Um, but during that time, I also learned balance because I, I, I don't love working out, but I know it's important. And um, I wanted to do it, but I couldn't figure out how, but just because I didn't have the commute, um, there were excellent workouts on things. So I cut off at like 5.30 every day. I started early, but cut off at 5.30 and went and did my workout. May, I may have to go back to it and start again, but it gave me structure with respect to, to you know, making sure I had balance and stuff like that. And it was, it, it was, a, it was, it was challenging. I'm, I'm glad that particular season is over. I didn't like working from home. I like being around people. Um, but it did, it did teach that, that, you know, you're, you're really capable of a lot more than you think you are. Right. Right. Um, you, you, you spoke about maintaining that work-life balance during the period of COVID, but how do you ordinarily maintain some sort of balance between your career, the individual, the faith-based woman that you spoke about mm -hmm. and the mentor to some, right. How do you manage that? So, um, it's it's not as hard as you think um everything is just has its bucket i love banking because banking doesn't happen on saturdays and sundays the banks aren't open and that's great um it doesn't mean that you can't consume yourself with work um but i i found there are a couple of skills that i had to learn in the last seven years that have stood me in good stead uh, one is email management um i i I'm a very organized person and what, and I think organization helps me a lot in terms of structure. I'm very structured. Um, but 
I feel anxiety when I have, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 300 emails unread because I believe that there's something in there that I'm supposed to be dealing with that has not been dealt with. Um, uh, in, in, in the first, when I first had um, got this job, I, I felt anxious all the time and I realized it was email management. And one of the first tools I tell anybody about is that um, no, just because I haven't, I'm, I'm here talking to you. Um, even though when I started this conversation, I may have had 18 emails. By the time I finish this conversation, I'll have 56. Um, and that's my day. Um, I will get three to 400 emails a day. But um, I mow them down and I feel a, a great sense of calm when I have 18 or 19. I can see them all on the one sheet there. There's stuff I know that can wait because it's just things I have to read for, for, for that sort of thing. So um, email management, but also um, cutting off at a certain time. Um, I put in a full day's work. Some, you know, like there are people that take lunch hours and stuff like that. I have a nice little bag here that warms up my food next to my desk. Um, it's right here now. Um, my food is in it. And when I finish this, I will have lunch at my desk you know once a week maybe I'll, I'll go up with some other people for lunch but I cook all my food I bring it here and I eat um and I work the whole day and then when the day is over I'm not spending the whole night staring at my phone looking at emails I just don't do that I don't need to do that because I've cleared all the emails off so to me that's why I say email management first because once you know you've covered off what people are expecting from you you know, then you have a sense of peace and you're able then to focus on the other sides. Uh, and on evenings, then I will, um, I have exercise regime where I have somebody that calls in and, and does um, um, FaceTime personal right. training. And then like last night, I, I was at church on Zoom. You know, before it wasn't Zoom, I, I'd leave, sometimes I would leave work and go straight to church or whatever. Um, but you know, I also sing, I'm, I'm, I lead worship as well and do those sorts of things. So you, it's planning, organization, structure, you know, having, making sure that I, I'm not thinking about it on the day of, but, you know, you, you think of what you have to do and you plan through, you know, your week, your month or whatever, and you schedule things so that you, things don't cause you anxiety. A lot of what we deal with is lack of planning and lack of organization. That's what causes the anxiety. So it's just, it's just trying to, to get more. And there are things that are going to come up, but you know, you don't, there's, there's, it's just not overwhelming because yes, you can handle the things that come up because you have structured and planned yourself. Right. So, but it all starts with email, email um, management. management. Agreed, agreed. Donna, in your perspective, do you think that the industry has evolved specifically regarding female professionals? Absolutely. Um, I look around now. Um, it's not just me that, that is here in Barbados in, in a leadership position. Carol John Marie is here as well. Um, so it's two of us um, leading two banks. Um, I see no difference between us and them, uh, uh, us and, and our male counterparts. Um, in my position, I'm actually... Um, you know, the, the, the president of the Bankers Association. <clears throat> I'm trying very hard to get out of that role and give it to somebody else. They won't let me. Um, so, you know, you feel respected by your peers because they have that kind of confidence in you um, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I think I think over the over the four years, you know, even to the public, you know, understanding who women are and what women are capable of. I don't think there's, I don't feel as if people doubt my ability to lead either here in the bank or of all the banks. You know, I don't, I don't feel that, um, you know, and, and why is that? Because you're able to handle yourself and manage situations and deal with complex problems and stuff like that. So to me, it's been a journey of just, you know, people understanding what you're capable of. I, I would say the same of, of our prime minister. I think when she first came in, people were wondering, you know, like, you know, does she even know what she's doing? And then in two twos, everybody was like, whoa, you know, this person, <laughs> you know, 
forced to be reckoned reckon with and that sort of stuff. And, and, you know, I like, I like to be, I like, I like to, to, I like that shock factor. I, I don't, I don't mind that at all. I think, I think that that's helpful. <laughs> so, you know, underestimate, go right ahead and, and then be shocked when, you know, you realize that that was not a good idea. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Fantastic. How do you encourage or empower your own team for success? Um, pulling them out of their comfort zone is, is one of those big things. Um, making sure that, you know, the, one of the other things that I would say that, that stresses people out is when you feel you have to do it all yourself and you do not delegate appropriately. Um, you feel that you're the only person that can do it well. And that's not true. Nobody learns that way. And, 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 and even if you're a leader now, you knew, you know that, that the reason you are is that somebody took a chance on you. And, and if somebody took a chance on you, why don't you take a chance on somebody else? No, it's, it's based on also observation of that person because you shouldn't, what you shouldn't do is throw people in at the deep end. That's not great um, unless you feel that's what they require um, to step up. Um, but, you know, give people the tools, teach them, you know, share with them what you see. Uh, and sometimes they're career limiting things to people that are just blind spots. Like they have no idea they do certain things, you know. Um, somebody might be really technically sound, but then when it comes to judgment in certain areas, it's poor. And, and, it's, and, and if that's the case, you need to share that with them. If they, they have time management problems, you have to share that with them. And, you know, being very open, um, in your feedback um, to people with respect to what what's working and what's not working, uh, I think helps your team to to really know what they need to work on, rather than keeping it so high level that they never quite understand what the problems are. And, you know, the more granular you can get with that, the better. Um, but in a way, you know, people people say that I'm firm but fair, uh, and and I and I and I pref and I like that. You know, I, I call a spade a spade. You, you never not know where you stand with me. Um, and it's important that people like that. People like um, knowing where they stand with you and not guessing all the time. Uh, and it's important that, that that's what you do. You, you have, you spend time with them. You have your one-on-one -on -one times with them. You, they feel comfortable sharing with you and you get feedback as well. Um, I always ask my team at least three or four times a year, what could I be doing better? Because, you know, the worst thing is when you are a leader and you think you are it and nobody, you know, and there's an emperor has no clothes situation where everybody can see your flaws. You've never worked on them. You think you're perfect. And meanwhile, the place is imploding and people are, much of grumbling behind your back because of, of what you're doing. So I prefer for people to, you know, and you have to be open enough and people feel comfortable enough to really share with you what they're seeing. So to me, it's a 360 situation. You tell them and them tell you and everybody feels comfortable that you're, you're, you're capable and comfortable having those conversations. That's a very good point in terms of being able to deliver quality feedback to employees. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think the acceptance comes when they know that the point that it's coming from is a point of building strength and resilience within the team, right? So that's definitely one of those qualities that our female leaders um, need to embrace and hone. So tell me, um, Donna, I mean, I imagine that this question is going to yield so many thoughts in your head, but who really inspires you and why this individual? Hmm. I, I could split it into two or three. Um, in terms of, 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 of being a force um, and, and, you know, commanding respect and, and leadership and those sorts of things, I have to say, uh, our Prime Minister, no, um, uh, from that perspective. Um, um, who inspires me in terms of, of, um, their lifestyle and, you know, their value system and who, who I want to be a lot like, um, 
there's there's, there's a there's a, a, a preacher called Charles Stanley. I don't know if you know him, but but basically, um, from that perspective, from a from a personal perspective, you know, when you think of your life, when I, when I think back on my life. And if I were to think of a life well lived, I think of 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 him, um, and and the amounts of people he's been able to influence um, for the for for the Lord, but also to um, the kind of life that he's lived. Um, so to me, it, it, it there are quadrants <laughs> right, um, right. in there. So it's not it's not just one person. That's two of two of maybe four, but but you know it's you know. <laughs> Um, I don't know Charles Stanley, but before the end of the day, I'm going to have a pretty good idea who he is. He's 85. He's 88 now. Um, ah, okay. He's, he's 88, and he actually um, he has a son that that um, is also in the ministry as well, which is 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 unusual. Who is just as good or better than he is with respect to being able to to communicate with people, Andy Stanley, um, and those they're very very impactful to me in terms of their ability to communicate um and you know unpack things and make it very simple for people to understand okay definitely somebody i'm going to go do some research on mm -hmm. um donna when faced with challenges what go-to strategy strategy do you employ to overcome depends on the type Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, going through the, the, the one of the hardest work challenges I ever had to deal with was the Barbados debt restructuring. Mm -hmm. um, that was complex. There were a whole bunch of both national and international um, um, stakeholders. Um, you know, there was the optics on it were huge. Um, and in a situation like that, you know, I, I was trying to lead uh, a number of banks that were all pretty terrified at, 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 at what could be happening. Um, massive losses um, possible, um, you know, international, international, um, inter, international persons that were also, um, international persons that were also very um, involved um, both consultants, um, consultants, and I would say um, heads of banks overseas, you know, Scotia and CABC and stuff like that, you know, people that, you know, in charge of, of the whole thing, everybody, you know, staring down at, at, um, at this situation. And then you have the government and all these things and, and having to deal with all of these different people. And this was one of those times when I felt the garden was very important to me. Um, it's because that's where I, um, that's where I, I went to, to, to think and, um, what got me through that was my faith because I remember, and I remember even sharing with the prime minister, um, there was one verse that came to me in the middle of the turmoil and stress. And it was, you know, when I, I, I didn't know what to say and I didn't know, you know, there were so many people that were wanting an opinion or thinking of what you, you know, what, why were you trying to make certain decisions and all that? I remember um, hearing um, in my spirit, Exodus 14, 14, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And there were many, many times when that strategy has worked sometimes you feel that the thing to do is respond and what you need to do is just be quiet and you know let the lord fight the battle and um things have a way of working themselves out um being wise enough and discerning enough so that you only speak when you need to speak um it was it was absolutely critical and um, that's what I share with people even now um, who are in challenging circumstances. I have, I have mentees who are, you know, CFOs of companies and stuff like that, who, you know, who have become very friendly with. And, and I have to share these same things with them. You know, sometimes when you think that all is lost, um, it's not. 
um, things have a way of working themselves out when it feels like the sky is falling, you know, hang on. Um, and things have a way of, of working themselves out. When you're dealing with people that are so egregious that you feel like, you know, you can't take it anymore, relax. Um, a lot of the times, you know, one of two things is going to happen. Either they are going to find themselves out or you will be out of that situation and onto something else and recognize that when you go onto something else, it is, that is also going to be for your good. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to, you know, be to your detriment. If, if, if it's allowed, it means that, you know, that's, that's the way it's supposed to be. But the, it's, it's a, it's a faith based um, view. Uh, but at the end of the day, it has, it has definitely stood me in good stead. And what, I recognized when it was all over, in the middle of it, it felt like chaos. And in the middle of it, um, at the end of it, um, you know, I was able to hear from people, you know, you went through that with, with the highest level of integrity. You know, you know, Prime Minister said that in front of everybody in one instance. Um, and then people from from my bank who, at the, in the middle of it, I said like, oh my gosh, you know, you know what is this going to mean for my career? came back afterwards and said to me, you know, you did extremely well in that circumstance or whatever. So it is just, it is just, you know, taking a breath sometimes and not freaking all the way out um, because there are going to be all sorts of circumstances that could come up in your career that will make you freak all the way out. And, and it is really to, you know, Try to keep it together as best as you but can. Keep it, really keep it together. And, and it's one, that's one of the things that women um, get a bad rap for. Um, you know, we are emotional generally, and, and we have to learn very much to manage our emotions. And, and, you know, you can freak out on the inside, but you don't have to let that be seen uh, and recognize that all of your emotions don't have to be shown to everyone. You know? Yeah, yeah. very profound. Um, response with that one because certainly we do know that as the nurturers women tend to be the far more emotional ones and we carry our hearts around I sometimes think not on our sleeve but on our forehead mm -hmm. um, that first and that is perhaps in all aspects of our lives the one thing that I think we need to get some measure of control over there's a time and there's a place for all of it um, and that's but, the one thing that men hold over you all the time. Oh, you know, she's going to, you know, she, you know, being a woman, just emotional yeah. and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, we have to, you know, all, all the women that do well in, um, in leadership positions have learned how to manage their emotions and been able to, to um, deal with that and, and not, yeah. you know. According to you, freak all the way out. I like that. All the way out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's almost one hour since we started this interview and I know that lunch bag is, is calling your name. So there's <laughs> one final question for you, Donna, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a big one. Mm -hmm. If you could define Donna Wellington in one single word, what would that be and why? Determined. It speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> does speak for itself and I'll tell you as yeah. we were speaking I tried to figure out okay what is she going to say and I wrote some down myself um, but I'm going to add determined it's a long list I will add determined to that list and certainly um, your career journey speaks to the fact that you you don't take no for an answer mm -hmm. and you certainly do not believe in glass ceilings um, mm -hmm. at least they're only a measuring stick for you Mm -hmm. So Donna, continue to do a fantastic job. I look forward to our continued engagement. I have certainly learned so much from you today and I feel so inspired by our discussions. I have no doubt that our listeners and our viewing public will feel exactly the same way. All right. I'm, I'm happy. I was happy to do it. And um, I hope it helps someone somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it will help a few people in a few different places. So again, thank you so much. And I really look forward to chatting again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.